Every one of us must at least once in our life face having a close friend or relative who suffers from a serious illness. For most of us, this illness will be cancer. And knowing this and the tremendous resources that we invest in fighting cancer, I might surprise you or even shock you if I claim that I think that we're actually not lacking cures for cancer. We have tremendously effective drugs to kill cancer, but when the doctor injects that into the patient, it will also affect the healthy cells, kill or basically injure them too. This means that we still cannot treat patients that are too weak for this kind of enduring treatment, horrible thing that you do to your entire body. And we also cannot treat people who have very aggressive cancers. But this makes it possible for us to reformulate the challenge that we have. Maybe we do not lack an effective treatment for cancer as much as a way of making that treatment work only when and where it is needed. So what would you think if in a few years from now you meet a medical doctor and he says that he just received these tiny little drones that he can radio to release their toxic drug cargo only when the drones sort of home in on the cancer itself? What he's effectively telling you is that he can cure and heal the patient without additional suffering, keeping the patient healthy during the treatment. And he or she will tell you that this is due to the latest advancements in medical nanotechnology. Would you believe that? Would, would you trust such a message? It sounds a bit like science fiction, right? But actually, you can do similar things based on very sound scientific ideas that are being researched in laboratories the world over in different ways. And I would like to use my time with you um, to share some of these ideas and concepts and give you a flavor of how we use them to already construct tiny little drones that are fighting cancer. But to do that, we first need a little bit of inspiration. And uh, for me, still, the most novel and fantastic ideas already out there, we can learn from nature. Look at how nature does things and learn a lot from it. And one of the things that we can learn is how to get something into the body and transport it around to find a certain destination. We can, for example, look at viruses. There are tiny, small capsules transporting the genetic cargo to basically any cell in your body and making you sick with an infection. But if I can understand the properties that these virus capsules have, I can make synthetic analogs of them to transport instead a drug to anywhere in the body that I want. Now, what can I do next? If I go out and talk to people about the idea that I can get inspired by biological systems on how to make such novel materials. I often get back, actually, that biological materials are very different from other materials. They are very different from what we humans typically make. Yes and no. If you're a scientist working on nanotechnology, you're acutely aware that the physical and chemical laws are always the same. It doesn't matter if it's biological or not. But biological materials actually do appear slightly different. And there is a reason, and this is a matter of scale. Because biological materials are often built up from components on the nanoscale. And if I go down and look at such small objects, like biological molecules, the components that make up the materials, they obey the same physical laws, but the forces that make them come together and give them their function and their structure are different to the ones that dominate the things that we're used to with intuition to see around us all the time. And maybe the prime example and best example of this is if I look around, I see gravity as the absolutely dominating force in the universe. It makes galaxies go around, and if I want to construct a house, I have to think about gravity so that it doesn't fall down. But if I'm tiny as a virus, gravity is insignificant. I'm actually too small for gravity. I don't feel it. Instead, what is very important are the electric interactions between molecules, and between molecules and water especially, which we have around us everywhere. What is also extremely important on this scale is that things are so small that they're moving all the time and colliding with each other. We only feel this very diffusely as heat, but on a nanoscale, this determines how materials are formed, which structures they have, and how they keep together. 
This leads us to one of the first very interesting observations about biological materials. And that is that, well, no one built them, no one made them. There are no hands putting the components together to make these beautiful structures. So how is that? Well, today we know that the blueprint for the structures and the materials that we see are actually found in the shape and distribution of physical properties in the building blocks. In this case, the biological molecules themselves. And how they put themselves together is a result of one of the most fundamental things in nature, which we call the principle of energy minimization, which you find locally and globally. Things try to come together in order to minimize the total energy of the objects and all the objects around them. If you're on a nanoscale, this becomes even more important because these things happen very fast, because everything is moving. So the building blocks are colliding and they try to match up, to match up each other's properties with each other and the molecules that are around them to form structures that minimize energy. Now think about that. What does that mean? That means that these materials just put themselves together spontaneously and this means I don't have to use energy to create them. It's very different to what our, we as humans usually do. We use a lot of effort and a lot of energy to create our materials. We put a lot of energy in making concrete to melt metals, bend it, stretch it, form it, nail it down, screw it together, We're using motors, heat, electric fields to move things around. And in the end, we might have constructed a house to protect us from the environment. Again, go back to nature. Compare this to a sea creature like the mollusk. It also needs to protect itself from the environment, create its own type of house. These are the beautiful shells that we call mother of pearl or nacre, which have very intricate hierarchical structures that we have a great deal of difficulty to make with human technology. But the mollusk doesn't have any hands, doesn't have any great resources of energy, but the only thing the mollusk has to do is to synthesize and secrete molecules and minerals which in the environment of the ocean puts themselves together to minimize the energy into a very complex structure that has almost super properties compared to similar materials that humans do. If I go even smaller, I can look at cells. They do something similar. They also synthesize a small set of typical building blocks. They synthesize lipids, basically fats, polymers such as protein and DNA. And in the structure of these molecules, their biological building blocks, you have the design of the materials, the functional units that make life possible as we know it. Lipids with some proteins come together and form the cell membrane, which defines the cell, the basic unit of life to the rest of the world. It also controls what comes in and out of the cell, thereby creating this distinction. You have proteins and DNA coming together to form chromosomes, which still is the most dense information storage media that we know. And you have polymer proteins that can fold themselves into tremendously complicated three-dimensional structures, like the photosynthetic complex that harvests the energy of the sun, makes it into chemical energy, which is still almost all of the energy that we as humans use, whether it's renewable or fossil. Now let's go to the next lesson. If these structures are formed by the molecules minimizing their energy in respect to the environment around them, what happens if the environment changes? You know, the environment changes all the time. Then the structure has to change too, right? And if the structure change, we've learned something else from biology, that on the nanoscale, structure means function. Really, on the nanoscale, what you look like is what you do and what you can do. So it means that when the environment changes, the structure, the material changes, its properties changes, and the function will change as well. What does that mean conceptually? Well, it means that we can make materials that almost appear like they're intelligent. When the environment changes, they take that information to change their structure, change their function, and something new will happen. It's also something that we are not used to, 
But we see biology replicate this concept over and over and over again. I'll just give you one example of this, and this is the cell membrane again. In the cell membrane, you find a basic structure as lipids that are sitting there in a two-dimensional structure. These molecules can either have fixed positions so that you know exactly where they are. They are sitting there like in a crystal, like in ice. But if you heat up the same membrane, give it some higher temperature, then suddenly it can melt, just like ice melts into water, and the molecules will move very rapidly around, but it's still a membrane. It just moves like a liquid in 2D. These two materials actually have very different properties. One is a solid and one is a liquid. And this the biological system can use to switch protein function on and off. But it can even do something much more simple. When you go from a solid to liquid, molecules can pass from one side of the membrane to the other. So you can let something pass through. Now I think we've collected enough ideas to try to construct again our cancer-fighting little drone. So let's start enumerating what we have learned so far. One is size. If I want to transport a cargo to anywhere in the body, let's use the size of a virus, because they can already do it. So I just need to create these small capsules and store my drug inside of it, and I'm ready to go. Ah, I cannot make something that small and put something inside of it and control it. At least I cannot mass produce it. But interesting enough, virus also cannot do this. The virus actually hijacks a cell to synthesize the components that make up the membrane, so it self-assembles again into a new virus that can be secreted out. And I know what properties these components have. So I can synthesize analogs of them that will self-assemble into a membrane capsules similar to that, which can contain a drug that now can be transported. Next thing, number two that we can identify from objects in the body that need to be able to move around or keep themselves separate is that their surfaces are always very liquid-like with a chemical property similar to water. I can copy this too. What I do is that I take a polymer and attach it to the building block, self-assembling into the membrane, and make this polymer highly flexible and contain a lot of water. By this, I create a stealth coating that makes it possible for the capsule not to stick to any surface within the body. It also acts as a camouflage for the immune system, so that the immune system gets difficulty to identify, hunt down, and destroy my capsules, which otherwise is the task of the immune system to destroy anything foreign that enters into your body. Number three. You already discussed one way in which I can take something from one side to the membrane, keep it there, and then suddenly let it go to the other side. If I make the capsule membrane first being like a crystal, then I heat it up into liquid, then during this transition, my drug molecules can come out from the capsule. So we can, of course, try then to just have such molecules have this transition, but now I need a heat gun that I can point into the patient exactly where the cancer is, and then I can release the drug only there. That might be slightly difficult because I probably killed the patient while I'm trying to cure her. But nanotechnology comes to the rescue again, because there are many ways in which I can make a nanoscale heat gun and then point it exactly at the membrane and heat up only that. I will tell you one of these versions that we can do. And that is that we can synthesize small iron crystals. And iron is something that I dare to put in my body because I'm already full of iron, so it's not toxic to me. So it's fine. But if I make my iron crystals nano size, they turn into nanomagnets. And if I put a magnet into a magnetic field that passes straight through the body, I can heat up such magnets. This is something I think almost all of you know, because you can put a frying pan on your induction stove. It heats up very fast, but if you put your hand there, you don't feel anything. Same effect. So I have my nano heating gun. Now I need to point it to the membrane. We know the trick already. Let's coat the nanocrystal with molecules that have the same properties as the inside of the membrane itself. 
then I shrink the size of the nanocrystal to be the size of the molecules that are sitting into the membrane. If I now mix everything together, what do you think happens? Minimization of energy. Everything will actually self-assemble with the nanoparticles in water or only found inside the membrane itself. So I pointed my gun. Now I have an antenna, so I can radio, if we call it that, with the magnetic field, the capsule, to tell it when the magnets heat up, when the membrane heats up, and when the drugs come out. And I can give this control drone to the medical doctor. Actually, the medical doctor can even monitor where these small capsules are inside the body and decide to flick the switch for the magnetic field when the capsules are accumulated in the cancer. Or he can try to focus the magnetic field in the area where he thinks the cancer is, and thereby making sure the capsules only release when they pass by. It's his choice. Now, I don't expect you to trust that this will fix all problems that we have in terms of curing cancer, because of course the world is a little bit more complicated than that. But I hope that you, now just like me, believe that we can learn quite a lot of, the, lot of different lessons from nature on how to apply technology on the nanoscale to achieve things which maybe as late as yesterday we thought were science fiction or maybe even possible, impossible. And I hope that you will trust that if we invest more in trying to understand how the tiny world around us works, that we can revolutionize our idea of what the material is, how we can make it, how much energy we need to make it, what functions that they can have, and also the concept, which is actually very new to us, that the material doesn't have to have the same properties all the time. It can always change, just like nature changes. And with that thought, I would like to leave you, and I hope that you have inspired by this. <laughs>